12. Uh, today, uh, deposit uh, banking, I would think that roughly 60 minutes uh, should be enough to cover deposit banking. So I'm going to take an extra, I don't know, maybe five minutes to review what we started last time. Is this included in the exam? No, that's not entering the exam. So, first of all, we are beginning with, is it? Yes, deposit banking. And with deposit banking, we are looking at the fundamental concept of a warehouse. So the first concept is of a warehouse. And warehouse is a place where people put stuff, their assets, on storage. So from warehouse, the extension was that of a money warehouse. So this is a place where people put their money for safe storage or safe guarding and it was equivalent to saying a bank. Alright, so the next concept was that of a where house Come on guys, vacation is over. Let's get back to what we're doing. If you got business, take it outside the room, okay? So, warehouse receipt. This is a document. A document. You're asking for a penalty? Alright, so, a document that the warehouse issues certifying or identifying that an asset has been deposited with the warehouse. So the receipt is a document or certificate of deposit. That's why the topic becomes deposit banking. <laughs> All right, the next major concept was that of credit and credit for all, at least uh, our purposes, purposes in economics, not law, is pretty much the same as a loan and a loan is a transfer or an exchange of present goods for future goods. In the most common case, these goods will be money. So this is an exchange of money that we or somebody receives today in return for money in the future. Any good today is worth more than a good tomorrow. Whatever you want it, you want it today. So we have the next concept of present good, which is more valuable. Let me see how I'm going to write this. Uh, let's try this. The value of present good is always greater than the value of the same good in the future. All right, this is just the way humans behave. Humans always prefer something sooner rather than later. All right, so this is something like one of the most fundamental assumptions made in economics that 
people prefer things sooner rather than later. And whatever the thing is, if you get it sooner, it's got higher or more value than later. Out of this follows the concept immediately that if there will be an exchange of one good for another present in the future, whoever is getting the good in the future must get some sort of compensation. And that compensation is simply called interest. All right, question on the back. Did you have any question on the back? Yeah. Yes. What if uh, this, uh, the value in the future will be bigger than this right now? Well, uh, again, we, we, we're not considering, uh, we, we are considering the same good. The same good is one loaf of bread today rather than one loaf of bread a week from today. And you're, for example, hungry. We're considering one uh, gallon of gasoline today versus a gallon of gasoline a year from today. Or one gallon of milk today versus a gallon of milk milk a year from today. So, the generic assumption is that the good is pretty much worth the same in the sense that a gallon of milk is a gallon of milk, it's got the same value. But the sooner in time, the more value just because people are impatient to consume. <laughs> is, is this answering your question? Similarly with one euro today and one euro a year from today. Well, you'd rather get it today because you could benefit from it, you know, from its spending power uh, today. So, the compensation is called interest and let me review again. If that compensation is for one unit of money, we call it a dollar or a euro, for one year, we call that compensation interest rate. So the rate normalizes interest for one dollar for one year. Is that fairly clear so far? Questions? All right, let's see what's next. All right, so the next concept is that of fungible commodity, let's call them fun fungible goods. So a fungible good is a good for which one unit could possibly be exchanged for another without any uh, major loss of value or of utility. Uh, lots of examples, one uh, gallon of gasoline uh, exchangeable for another gallon of gasoline of the same octane number and properties. One gallon of diesel versus another gallon of diesel. Uh, for more or less the same quality of wheat, one uh, bushel of wheat uh, exchanged for another bushel of wheat. Uh, gold will be example, Symbol, uh, s silver will be example. So all of these are fungible goods. And fungible goods allow for what or where we are moving today in the lecture, that of fractional, fractional reserve banking, which I'll be explaining probably half of the lecture today. All right, so let's see what's uh, next. Uh, all right, next one is uh, section two, deposit banking. One of the fundamental ideas which I uh, explained uh, at least last time partially was that when you deposit your chair or your watch or your jewelry, let's say a wedding ring uh, at the warehouse, uh, it does not change or transfer ownership. It still is yours and the warehouseman does not get 
temporary ownership of, uh, of your uh, assets. Now, with deposit banking, judges have made a major exception, and you'll get to read on uh, my pages 61, Carr versus Carr and Devane versus Noble and Foley versus Hill, is that uh, in case law has developed, for whatever reason, uh, that when you make a deposit in the bank, legally, technically, it is considered to be a loan at least in the Western banking system. Again, that's fairly recent uh, phenomenon, probably in the last, yes, 200 years or so. Back in Roman times, that was not the case. So, when you actually deposit your money with the bank, it is considered that as if you loaned your money to the bank. All right, so that's important to understand. So that now, because the money is treated as loan from you to the bank, the bank now can actually take your money and re-loan it. Okay, the bank may use your money and re-loan it. Well, you're going to say, well, this is exactly what banks do today, right? And the answer is, indeed, that's exactly what they do today. But the tricky part is to understand the fractional reserve part of it because it makes a world of difference. Difference between a night and a day, whether the banking is not fractional or whether the banking is fractional. And I'm going to be getting to that uh, today. All right, let's discuss the basic concept of a reserve. So, question is, what is a reserve? And a reserve is an asset which a bank or a warehouseman keeps a, to, let's say, to redeem a liability. So, if you deposit, let's say, 10 gold coins, you deposit 10 gold coins uh, at the warehouse, and the warehouse gives you a warehouse receipt, which we also call deposit receipt. At that point, come on guys, someone's asking for a penalty, okay? Please. So, if you deposit 10 gold coins and the bank or warehouseman gives you a 10 uh, note for those receipts, uh, so, sorry, a note for those coins. What he has is your gold, which is the asset, and he also has a liability, the receipt. At any point in time, you can go and redeem. To redeem means to claim your receipt, to claim your receipt, and to get back your asset. In other words, redeeming is give me my 10 gold coins back. So the reserve is the gold coins that the bank keeps at hand so that it can redeem or pay back a deposit. Now, the important to understand about reserve is that it is any asset. It could be any Asset. For example, in a gold standard, when you deposit a gold coin and he gives you a piece of paper, it will be gold. In today's uh, environment, you deposit, let's say, 500 euro in the bank, the reserve will be the euro itself. In a typical warehouse, let's say crude oil warehouse, uh, maybe let's say 1 million barrels on storage, and the warehouseman will be issuing warehouse receipts. The crude oil, a barrel of crude oil will be the reserve. So whatever has been deposited and for the reserve it has to be on hand and the key is immediately available for redemption. So the concept is that of
redemption. Redemption simply means a withdrawal of deposit from a warehouse or from a bank. Okay? So, the reserve is an asset which is on hand immediately available for redemption. In most cases, for commercial banks, the reserves will be, and it's simply called, cash. All right, so uh, let's see now. Well, let's move over here. Number 10. So number 10, we move to uh, 100% reserve banking. In a 100% reserve banking, whatever is penalty for both of you, okay? In a 100 reserve uh, banking, whatever has been deposited, the commercial bank has available all completely every single lev or every single dollar or every single gold coin is completely available completely available all right so here is the key word here for the de uh, for deposit is that Demand deposits are what we call fully backed. So fully is associated with 100% reserves. Fully backed means that whatever, anything and everything that has been deposited on demand is certainly available in cash and available to redeem at any point in time. All right. So far, so good. I'm still now moving to fractional reserve. So next is 11. Fractional. Fractional reserve. Bank. Well, one of the important characteristics of bankers is greed. They want to make more money. So, rather than keeping people's deposits on hand and available entirely, bankers' logic goes like this. There is no chance that all depositors will rush today and redeem their money today. Probably, maybe, 20 or 30% of the people, in the worst case scenario, will withdraw their money today or this week, meaning simultaneously at the same time. And they say, well, let's just in case be safe. And if we're safe, we're going to be keeping half of the deposits available. And the other half, we can, of course, lend. Again, why lend the money? Simply because bankers would earn interest on it. So, if bankers keep half of these deposits, this will be a little example of 50% uh, reserve. Another example will be if bankers expect maybe 10, maybe 15, maybe 20% of the people coming at the same time to get their money and bankers will say, well, we're going to hold at least 25% and the other 75 we can reload, well, then you have 25% reserve banking. Now, What's the next concept that relates to fractional reserve banking? Is the concept of 
a note. A note is a technical legal term similar to receipt which denotes that there is some sort of a deposit. So, a note is a possibly a legal document certifying that something happens. It's similar to receipt. So, when you put your money in the bank, let's say a gold coin, what the bank will do is give you a note, okay? And we call this note a bank note. Bank. Bank note, okay? So, bank note is what banks usually issue when people deposit gold with them, all right? So, if the bank has at some point, uh, let's say, a uh, hundred coins, the bank will issue hundred bank notes certifying that people actually deposited their money with the bank, their gold coins with the bank. Now, what happens with the banknote itself? What happens with the banknote itself? Well, cash or gold originally would circulate this money as people will exchange one gold coin for goods and so forth. Over time, people find that the banknote is somewhat safer, somewhat easier to carry, and over time, when a payment is made, rather than take the banknote, actually walk in the bank, actually withdraw your gold coin, meaning take, put it in your pocket, then walk to whomever, whomever you pay, and then give him the gold coin, and what he's gonna do with the gold coin? Well, he's gonna walk back to the bank and deposit it back. You see, that's quite a bit of a complication. The simpler way to do it is simply to give that person the banknote. When you give the person the banknote, now you do not have the claim on that gold <coughs> in the bank, but the new person has the claim on the gold in the bank. Is that, is that fairly clear? So, the banknote begins to function as money. as money, as a medium of exchange. So suddenly gold was withdrawn from circulation, gold is money, and now the banknote, which is the paper itself, begins to function as money. Again, I'm not saying it is money, all I'm saying is that it functions as money, it functions as a medium of exchange. The better term for this is we call it in economics, as a special term, money substitute. So it functions as a money substitute. All right, is that clear so far? So, now we get to the next concept, which is, again, fairly simple, but provides the link to fractional reserve banking, which is a, well, you're the banker. You know because you simply know that gold's got a lot of value and everyone is eager to get gold, and at the same time, you could manufacture a banknote as many as you want. And rather than saying 10 gold coins or 10 gold ounces, you just write another zero and it becomes 100. So you know, and for your point of view, the banknote itself, the issuing costs practically nothing. You just write another one, you put in your signature, your stamp, and whatnot. So when you create a loan and you're trying to give money to somebody, you actually would try not to give them the gold itself, because you value gold a lot. You're trying to give them instead the bank note and hope that they will be used as money. So the tricky part is that when bankers provide a loan, they would prefer to give the loan in the form of a 
banknote. All right, that's the form they give it. So, uh, for example, you're saying, hey, I need to, for whatever reasons, uh, uh, let's say I'm uh, producing bread. In order to produce bread, I need the flour. I want, uh, uh, you know, I'll go to the baker and say, hey, I really need a loan for, I don't know, 1,000 bushels of, uh, uh, of flour. Uh, could you give me some loan? And the banker says, well, I can give you banknotes and you will be returning them back to me, possibly in gold. The banker never minds getting the real thing, right? So, uh, the guy says, sure, can I spend it? And if the banknote has been already used as money, money substitute or paper money, effectively the person knows that he can take that uh, banknote and actually spend it. So. What the banker does is would issue a new banknote. Would issue a new banknote. And again, now engaging in lending and engaging in lending with by issuing a new banknote, note for which there is no actual gold. What happens at this point in time is that the banker creates more, creates more banknotes. There's actually gold. So let's try to make a picture here. Oh, let's use red. Let's use red. It's going to be uh, gold. You have five gold coins with the banker. You also have uh, five notes. The banker issued these five notes and he holds the coins and the banknotes themselves circulate among people. Well, at the point in time when there is a loan and the guy uh, who makes bread comes and says, give me some, at that point the banker will issue brand new banknotes. He'll issue one, two, maybe Three, all right, let's do four, five. So the part is that when he issues new ones, they are issued, we call them unbacked, unbacked. So backing simply means there is actual reserve. Unback means that there is no reserve on hand. So, so far we had a one-to-one -one relationship and now you have twice more uh, banknotes than coins. So this situation here will represent 50% Fractional. 50% fractional simply uh, it means the ratio of notes to coins. So the percentage, the percentage means notes to, and rather than coins, the better term that we use is reserves. Because it may be crude oil, it may be some other stuff. stated, if the banker has 100% reserves, he cannot extend more credit, meaning cannot issue extra banknotes and profit from them. If he can use 50% fractional reserve banking, he can issue twice, he can issue twice the banknotes. And for each banknote, he can earn money, he can earn interest on them. Now, if he could engage in 25% fractional reserve banking, he could issue four times more banknotes and make four times more interest on it. Or he could engage in 10% fractional reserve banking, he could issue 10 times more 
banknotes and make 10 times more money. So the lower the fractional reserve banking, the more profitable the whole banking operation is. So question. My question was, isn't it reserve divided by notes? Because in this case you have 10 notes and 5 reserves. And yes, so, yes, yes, that's reserve divided by, that's the bonus point. All right, don't lose it, okay? So that's it. So we, we, we have two ways to think about it. Uh, it's uh, this one, to, the way I wrote it is in terms of the multiplier. So how much reserves we got? And for those reserves, how much notes are actually circulating? So for the reserves, uh, in this particular case, I have five coins in reserves and I have ten and I have 10 banknotes circulating. So 5 divided by 10 converted into percentages gives us 50% fractional reserves. Okay? So now let's introduce that you reminded me. Let's introduce the opposite concept. The concept of how many notes we issue per unit of reserves. And this, of course, is the inverse of the previous one. We simply call this the deposit multiplier. Deposit multiplier. So, again, providing the example, if our fractional reserve ratio, ratio is 20%, is the reserve ratio, is 20%, the deposit multiplier is 5. Okay? Is that, is that fairly clear so far? Alright, so, as reserve ratio is lowered, of course, the banker, for the same amount of coins, can issue more and more and more banknotes. Now, issuing more banknotes is simply inflationary. So, the most important property of fractional reserve banking is that it is in inflationary. All right? This is the most important property, inflationary. The next is very simple statement. The lower the reserve ratio, the more inflationary the system. Okay? Simple as that. So, the lower the reserve ratio, the higher the deposit multiplier. So, the deposit multiplier effectively measures how inflationary the system is. Okay? And now, with 100% reserve banking, we can state that 100% reserve banking is non-inflationary. Any questions up to this point and see what else I have left? Uh, any questions? Is, is, is everything fairly clear? Alright, so uh, in, in other words, what fractional reserve banking allows is basically the most common sense uh, way to understand it is allows the banker himself to print himself banknotes and profit from them, at least profit from the interest that they collect on, the, uh, on, on those banknotes. All right? So is that fairly clear so far? All right, so this concept is known and you'll see it and read it in every single macroeconomics and money and banking textbook. This whole process is called, uh, let's see, so concept 14. Uh, Money 
creation out of thin air, out of nothing. So, what this is saying is that fractional reserve banking allows commercial banks to create money out of nothing, all right, or out of thin air. So this is what it's called, and this is first the magic of modern commercial banking, and second, the true, genuine source of uh, excess profits that commercial banks enjoy over every other business. No other business, except possibly for the central bank, has the power to create money out of nothing. Now, you'd say, well, what if the bank cannot issue that little piece of paper banknote, okay? Instead, all it does is just creates a deposit. Well, the answer to this question is amazingly simple. It's basic or elementary logic. Is that the banknote for all economic purposes, because legally it's different, has all properties, has all properties identical to a deposit. To a deposit. All right. So, uh, you guys, any one of you who's gone to the bank and the bank might issue like a passbook or a savings book or a deposit book, you have this. Well, that deposit book is essentially the banknote or the money that the bank issues. All right. Of course, you cannot use your passbook to give it to him, but it could transfer money from your account. To his account, all right. That's what banks do. So, how do we call the order to transfer money from his account, let's say, to her account? Money hmm? Transaction. You, well, it's a transaction. It's not a money order. Check. It's a check. All right. Well, okay. That, let's let's give a point there. It's a check. So, a check. Again, I'm expanding a little bit on deposit banking. A check is an order, and let's clarify, a written order to, to the bank by the depositor himself, ordering the bank to transfer his deposit to someone else. Okay, that's, that's all it is. Please pay to the order of Jane. And when Jane brings the check to the bank, the bank will do one of two things. It will transfer his deposit into her deposit. And if she doesn't have a, an account in the bank, well, simplest thing to do is the bank will open an account and then will say, okay, the hundred that you deposited, that the check you got is deposited in your account. And they may politely ask you, would you like to withdraw your hundred or keep it in our bank? Okay? Simple as that. So the check is a written order, again, by the depositor ordering the bank to transfer a deposit, we sometimes call it a money balance or a deposit balance, to someone else, all right? Now, that someone else may want just to deposit the money in his account, or instead, he may want to withdraw it. That's up to, you know, the person who is getting paid. We call that person a payee. All right, that's half a point, still a good one. Payee, okay? All right, so uh, let's see if I'm missing anything else. 100% uh, reserve banking, non-inflationary. This is equivalent to saying that the money multiplier equals identically 
to 1 equals identically to 1. So when the money multiplier is 1, this means that you have 100% reserve banking. In fractional reserve banking, the deposit, okay, well, let's use here because uh, I don't want to confuse you. It's a little bit of a difference between deposit multiplier and money multiplier. I don't want to get in trouble at least today. Uh, the deposit multiplier is uh, 1. Here, the deposit multiplier is greater than 1. So, multiplier of 1 means non-inflationary, means 100% reserve banking. Deposit multiplier greater than 1 is inflationary. That's more than 1? The deposit multiplier is greater than 1, bigger than 1. Uh, we have a case of some countries which experience deflation. Yes. So like, what is the reason for that? Does it does it have to do with something reserve banking or? Uh, yes, of course. Banking? Okay, so what is deflation? Now let's let's we have how much time? Uh, oh, a lot of time, right? So uh, she's asking about well, some countries experience deflation. Yes, they do. Uh, Japan has been at least. Uh, again, the definition of deflation is it lower prices or is it shrinking money and credit meaning lower money supply so it's nicer to say monetary deflation or price deflation all right so what is the point of this whole thing the point of this whole thing is that whatever the money meaning the reserves and the total amount of money uh sorry the total amount of reserves in the whole banking system uh, 17, let's introduce another concept because he's asking and this is where macroeconomics, monetary economics leads. It's called monetary base. Monetary in this particular case refers to the reserves, refers to the total amount of reserves in the whole banking system altogether, okay? So, if the central bank simply keeps reserves constant, they don't grow at all, they just fixed, okay? In that particular case, can commercial banks expand credit? No. No, the answer is they can with deposit banking and with fractional reserve banking, they can always expand, expand some more credit by lowering a little bit the reserve ratio. So let's introduce fractional reserve banking. Let's introduce, I already used it a whole bunch of times, this 50% or 25%, we call this reserve ratio, okay? So this actually here reserves to notes, we call this reserve ratio. So, suppose you have 1,000 in reserves, Again, I'm moving along, uh, trying to explain, but it takes a little while, but this is, again, exactly what we're doing uh, the next couple of weeks, is you have a bank, and the bank has fixed amount of reserves, how it got it, whether it's own capital, doesn't matter. He's got a reserve equal to 1,000. So, initially, it doesn't matter what initial it is, uh, the bank's got a total credit, or which is more or less equivalent, I'm going to be explaining that uh, later. Uh, it's got a total credit of, it's nicer to say a total amount of deposits, 2,000. And if this is the case, the fractional reserve is, the ratio is 50%, yes, 50%. So, the question now that I was asking originally, well, can the bank expand more credit? The answer is, sure, if they're willing to lower their reserve ratio. If they lower it to 33.333%, 33 
they can easily expand on the same reserves, meaning on the same monetary base, they can expand to 3,000. Well, would the bank be willing to go further and lower its reserve ratio to 20%? Sure, banks do it all the time. And they will expand up to 5,000. And then, with a 10% reserve ratio, they'll expand to, uh, let's say, 10,000. And let's put in a little extreme, but for major Wall Street banks, that's close to about, right? They can go as low in real life as 2%. Only the big Wall Street banks, we call them money center banks, meaning these are the biggest of the biggest, just the top, let's say, 5 or 10 US banks, Citigroup, Bank of America, they can lower their reserves out down to 2%. So they can easily expand all the way to 50,000. So the point that I'm making is that even though the reserves are identical, the banking system, the commercial banks themselves, if they're not controlled or regulated by lowering their reserve ratios, they can increase their deposit multiplier and engage in inflation and therefore engage in inflationary policy. You had a question? Yeah, I have a question. Does the money lose their value? Yes, the money, of course, as they increase the money supply, the money loses its value. But here is the key. Remember, if the money loses value, not everybody loses at the same time. Who creates the money and who collects the interest first is the commercial bank. So, being the first in the chain, yes, money loses value, but the commercial bank profits or benefits or gains the most or gains more than anyone else down the chain. The first borrowers will be the next to profit. Maybe these are major corporations or someone who in 2001 or two was able to get a credit from a bank, bought a house, and today his house is worth five times more. Well, the house is not worth 5,000 more, right? I mean, this pen today, this pen five years from today, if it has the same quality, it's got more or less the same value, similarly with houses, it's that money in which we measure the value of the house has fallen roughly four times in terms of houses, right? You see, you, you, you gotta, if you're going to be doing good economics, you always got to think backward. You shouldn't think the house, uh, the, the, the value of the house in terms of money, because the value of money is unstable. I mean, they can just print as much as they want. You got to think the opposite way. The value of money in terms of houses or in terms of pizzas, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So uh, that's the, the, the point. You got to think. So I'm now driving back to <laughs> your. So where is your, the answer to your question? All right. The answer to your question is that as the fractional reserves get lower and lower, the banking system gets progressively more unstable and more unstable. Is that fairly clear? Of course, now you've issued 50,000 on a very 1,000 reserve. All that is necessary is that someone who gets to hold two or three thousand of your bank notes or deposits walks in the bank and says, give me the money, right? So all it takes is a little bit of, you know, very few people, meaning a small percentage of people walking into the bank and the bank is bankrupt, all right? So number one is, again, money is losing its value and two, the banking system becomes progressively less and less stable. So the result of all this is that at some point, people will start withdrawing some money. For example, if the case was up to 10,000, someone's going to take maybe 
500. Again, you, you got to think not in terms of three people. You got to think as if the bank's got 500 clients, each probably having 20 deposits. So someone walks in, withdraws 20. Another one walks in, withdraws 20. So soon, rather than 1,000, the bank's got a reserves of 900. What's the bank going to do? Well, the answer is the bank is not going to expand credit. Instead, the bank is going to contract credit. How is a bank contracting credit? The answer is very simple. As it gets paid back, it does not issue new credit. So, there is no issuance of new credit, and at the same time, everybody else has got to pay back. So, Again, once the banking system gets too stretched, meaning the reserve ratio gets dangerously low, and some people for some reason decide to withdraw their money, why? Well, they may be just guys like me who don't trust the Bulgarian level, the Bulgarian banking system, just walks in and says, uh, I just want to get my money and want to get it not in Bulgarian level, let's say in Euro. Remember, for our banking system, Euro is the reserve of our Bulgarian left. And the Bulgarian left is the reserve of our deposits. So as people get to withdraw their money, meaning to draw on the reserves, banks get to lose reserves and banks are forced to contract credit. So the process of lowering the reserve ratio, we also call it, or is an example of a credit expansion. And as people get to withdraw credit and the bank loses reserves, the bank must contract credit. We call it credit contraction. And credit contraction results in shrinking money supply, money and credit, and therefore results in price deflation. So, again, it doesn't happen just because it happens. It always happens after many, many, many years of credit expansion, okay? Uh, I'm going to be discussing it's, uh, the limits of credit expansion. Again, why banks can't just expand forever. Did you have a question there? Yeah, I wonder if I borrow money, will I consultation? Uh, uh, I can't hear it. No, if you burn money, no, you just, you just, you, you, you just suffer yourself a loss. You could have bought with your 10 lever four pizzas, right? Uh, instead, you suffered your loss. So everybody that holds money would uh, get a little bit of a gain by increasing their purchasing power or by a lesser loss of purchasing power. Hmm? Deflation no, 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 oh, 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 wait, 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 it's neither. Inflation is increase in the money supply. And increase in the money supply usually results, sometimes with a lag of six, nine months, or maybe a year or two, results in rising prices. And rising prices mean or result in lower purchasing power of money. So yes, monetary inflation ultimately leads to loss of purchasing power, all right? So it ultimately leads, doesn't mean it is, it means it results, it causes it. There is a clear causal relationship. Fractional, the more uh, expansionary, by expansionary I mean the lower the reserve ratio, the more expansionary the banking system, the more inflationary it is, and therefore the more or the higher the loss of purchasing power. The correct way to think about it is that the loss of purchasing power for the people is the gain of the banker. All right. So what the bankers do is effectively extract purchasing power from the people by imposing on them an inflationary tax, all right? Is that, is that making things clear? That's why everybody wants to be in a bank. When you're in a bank, you not only just earn a regular pay yourself, 
you're extracting, taxing common people, and therefore the bank makes a whole lot more money than any other competitive business, and therefore can allow to pay higher salaries, got the nicer offices. Questions? You had a question. Does the current uh, American economy crisis, which has to do with this credits for buying houses, yes. have to do with this ratio, with this reserve? Absolutely. Quite correct. This is uh, quite correct. Although I don't really want to get into uh, the, the technicalities, that's what I I do in my 400 level courses like a uh, bunch of weeks like four five six weeks I'm teaching the credit crunch right now this is exactly what happened is the whole monetary let's call it the financial system was expanding and expanding and expanding uh, without limits many 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 times over it technically lowered the reserve ratio now let me try to explain a little bit uh, because it's uh, somewhat relevant, is that it was not the commercial banking system. There is a new concept. Uh, it's very modern. Uh, I mean, this is the ultra modern modern banking. It's called the, let's use it in blue, shadow. Shadow banking. system, shadow banking system. Let's clarify a little bit. Commercial banks, we all know what it is. I defined it last time. It engages in loan banking and deposit banking, everything we've been talking so far. Through regulations, there are fundamental limits that the central bank imposes on commercial banks' credit expansion. The two major limitations are minimum, again, I'm jumping one or two lectures ahead, so I mean, we're covering what we're supposed to cover anyway. Minimum reserve requirements. capital requirements. Let's explain each. Minimum reserve requirement is a law or regulation usually imposed by the central bank onto commercial bank which requires a minimum reserve ratio or a minimum percentage of reserves which commercial banks must maintain. If not, they would be considered technically in bankruptcy or the simplest way to do or handle banks that don't comply is you just take their banking license and declare them not a bank anymore, right? So, minimum reserve requirement uh, historically has been for most of the times 10% for most of the countries. Uh, let's say recently, up until recently in Bulgaria it was 8%. Uh, the central bank for uh, implementing monetary policy, meaning our commercial banks have been engaging in a wild credit expansion and the central bank wanted to lower or counter that credit expansion, raise it from 8 to 12 percent. So this is a percentage which every bank must maintain and it is within the regulation or a law. Of course, if the central bank maintains the reserves and says 10 percent, the commercial bank can expand up to 10,000 and that's it, no more. Similarly, with minimum capital requirements, these minimum capital requirements are known as capital adequacy. This is the owner's capital. For commercial bank, we call it, anyone remember? Bank capital. So this is the minimum 
percentage of bank capital that a commercial bank must maintain. So, back to your credit crunch, right? So, I'm explaining this one. So, the point is that given that these were fairly stringent requirements and commercial banks couldn't expand on their own, what they did is, uh, let's say, take a commercial bank, you've got some assets, you've got some liabilities, it creates a new fictional institution, a new fictional institution, shifts assets here, possibly, uh, may shift some other liability and create another institution which is not technically or legally a commercial bank, not subject to minimum reserve requirements or to capital adequacy requirements. And this new institution can expand credit as much as it wants. So these little institutions were running on, uh, again, they were, and that's the word that's used today that you'll be reading, called leveraged 20 to 1, some were leveraged 30 to 1, and some were leveraged 50 to 1. 50 to 1 means that effectively their deposit multiplier was like 50. They are not commercial banks, but they could expand easily 20, 30, or 50, okay? So what might be these institutions? Well, one such institution which is very popular today, everybody has heard, the number just was over 10,000, it's called a hedge fund. All right, so hedge funds would usually do these kind of things. In the institution which the bank will sponsor is called um, SIV, Structured Investment Vehicle. And the key to all of these is that they are not subject to minimum reserve requirements and capital adequacy requirements. And therefore, now we call them non-bank financial institutions, they can expand an awful lot, meaning they can expand rather than just 10 to 1, 20 to 1, 30 to 1, 50 to 1. So, what the banking system was doing was channeling credit through these institutions and it was leveraging the system, meaning, by leveraging, meaning using a deposit multiplier a lot, a lot higher than typical for a normal, regular commercial banking system, okay? And if that's the case, for example, for a regular commercial system, it may be, let's say, a multiplier of 10 and reserve requirements of 10. For these, maybe 30 or 50. And here is the key. Suppose that this SIV or hedge fund, doesn't matter what, invested in these subprime loans, and let's say it is a leverage 30 to 1 and 4% of these subprime loans blow up. What happens with an SIV like this which is leveraged effectively 30 to 1 and 4% blow up? What happens? Anybody? Bankrupt. Yes, it's bankrupt. Let's give another bonus point. This is exactly correct. In other words, if it's leveraged 30 to 1, this simply means that it has 3.3% its own capital. And if it runs a 4% loss, this means that the SIV is technically bankrupt. If the SIV is technically bankrupt, what's the next step in a bankruptcy? Typical, usually, what happens? Closure of the bank. Hmm? Closure of the bank. Closure of the bank, so the next step usually is called a liquidation. Liquidation is the process of selling the assets of an entity, could be a person, could be a school, could be a university, could be, I don't know, any business. So the sale of assets, meaning turning the assets into liquid cash and satisfying the liabilities. All right, so. 4% losses result in the technical bankruptcy of the SID or the fund or whatever that 
uh, legally was called the institution. So now you have 30 times, because that's the leverage, you got 30 times more assets flooding the market on sale. So these assets are on sale. What happens with the value of those assets? Well, they of course go down. I mean, if you got to sell 30 or 50 billion of subprime loans, this is going to depress the value of subprime loans. Well, what's the next logical step that happens? Well, their value goes down, I don't know, by 10 or 20 percent, whatever. And now the next SIV, which holds similar assets, subprime loans or prime loans or whatever, turns out that it, ha it suffers also the losses because these mortgages, th these are just loans, went down. So the liquidation of one SIV results in losses of the next SIV which holds similar assets because these were liquidated. It's called a fire sale prices, meaning a substantial discount or substantial losses. These assets lost some value. We gotta sell $50 billion of anything if price is gonna fall. And now these here start losing value and the liabilities may possibly be fixed. So the assets shrink to the point where again, if it's highly leveraged, the next SIV might blow up as a consequence. So, now you get into a chain reaction. The first drives or causes the assets to fall and the bankruptcy of the second. The second causes the bankruptcy of a third. You got what's called a house of cards. One falls and then another. Of course, you got to understand I'm explaining all of this for a completely different reason also, is that whether these are straight commercial banks or other financial institutions, the mechanism of one falling in which, in which in, terms, uh, in, in turn drives the next going bankrupt and the next going bankrupt, we have a term in finance and in economics, this is called, anybody? The domino effect. The domino effect. So the problem with today's credit crunch is that the institutions were extremely leveraged. 20, 30 to 1, 40 to 1. So 2, 3, 4 percent losses usually result in the bankruptcy of the respective institution. And this involves another wave of selling. And one bankruptcy leads to the next and to the next. And you get yourself a credit crunch where everybody is trying to sell and there is no one on the other side to buy. Is it time, guys? All right, I think I covered everything for what it's uh, uh, worth today. Yes, everything has been covered, so uh, we're done. Next time, uh, we're going to have uh, roughly 45 minutes uh, of uh, midterm and then some lecture, okay? All right, we're done.